Happy Monday, everyone. Or rather, I'm, I'm recording this on Saturday when it's a gorgeous 80 degrees out. I've got my window open. So at least we have that in the middle of our social distancing and quarantine to make us feel a little bit more upbeat about life. Today's topic is going to be great if you tend to like political science and political history. In fact, the whole week is sort of based on an idea of a, uh, what I would call a hypothetical history. What would have happened, what history might have looked like if Athens hadn't invested so much in the idea of a direct democracy? Athens, as we've seen in our history and in our game, uh, can be a chaotic place where everybody's ideas get the same amount of airtime. But it wasn't always that way. And so in today's lecture, I'm going to be taking us in a little bit of a blast to the past of archaic history and look at an institution that by the time of our game had largely been crippled. So the title of today's lecture is Let Wiser Minds Prevail, Athens and the Areopagus. I have a feeling that at some point uh, in our reading, you've probably come across the term Areopagus a few times, but maybe haven't really known what it is. And if that's the case, that's perfectly okay because uh, the Areopagus by the time of our game was largely a crippled institution. But while it may not be technically responsible as a historian to play out hypothetical history, it sure is fun. So in today's lecture, I'm going to try to have a look at how Athenian history might have gone differently if they had kept their Areopagus a powerful institution like the Spartan Gerousia and placed more power in the hands of experienced um, smaller groups of leaders. All right, you ready? Let's get started. So rather than kick off with the big idea, I actually want to try to dive into what it would feel like if we were still on campus and if we still had our game going. This is the third time I've taught Athens and Sparta as a game, and I've usually observed that by the time we get to, to weeks um, 12 to 13, a few patterns are starting to emerge in our democracy, our direct democracy within the game. Some of these patterns have already been happening before we left for spring break. So first of all, bribery, or at the very least, the infusion of money into the game. People offering to buy votes, people offering to exchange economic packages for votes, um, and, and some underhanded dealing of money. In my first section, as you know, uh, somebody embezzled a fair bit of the treasury. A second thing we begin to see emerge is mob mentality, which is the class getting really whipped up about a particular topic without a whole lot of reason or argumentation and just a sort of mob style thinking takes over. This happened uh, in my first section when our class decided uh, that someone had embezzled the money and we needed to put all the government officials on trial. And in my second section, it happened when you all blamed Tyler um, Lithocles for being some sort of Spartan traitor, right? We didn't have a whole lot of evidence to go on. We were just in a bit of a frenzy to point fingers. And then the last thing that we often really starts to dawn on us by week, uh, the, by the fifth game session is just how slow and deliberative our democracy is. We notice how many game sessions it takes to pass something, how many times someone has to speak on an issue or push an issue in order for it to get passed. In my first game session, for example, um, Logan, who was playing Lithocles, he managed to get you guys, if I remember correctly, to pass the law to fund uh, the rebuilding of the long walls, but not of ships. But I'm sure that if we had come back after spring break, he would have had to try again and again to get you guys to rebuild ships for some sort of new Delian League mission. So this is the time in our game when democracy begins to feel like it has side effects, like it has some unpleasant aspects, even if everybody does have a say. And ultimately, that tends to bring us by the midpoint of our game to ask ourselves, is it worth it? Are all these things like mob rule, corruption, disruption, is it just worth it? Are these aspects of direct democracy that we're going to have to live with? Or is it possible, as some of the factions, especially the Socratics and the oligarchs suggest, is it possible that there's a better way? Is there a better method for picking leaders and for distributing power? Is there a mechanism by which we could make voting more efficient or we could limit voting to people who have certain expertise or interest in that topic, right? 
Now, the first time that idea gets voiced, it usually gets shot down pretty quickly. And indeed, in both of my game sessions, the Socratic factions failed to persuade their fellow Athenians that creating some sort of uh, Socratic test or test of expertise or intelligence would be worth it. And that's not surprising. It's a really hard thing to convince fellow Athenians of, and they tend to be really skeptical of the Socratics. But what the Socratics are trying to get at in that test is this notion that maybe we could get around some of these negative side effects in our democracy if only we had a more streamlined process for picking leaders, right? Now, in order to try to blow the context of our game up into a larger historical rendering of these challenges with democracy, I first want to impress upon you just how much your thinking has already been shaped by the fact that most of you were born into a liberal democracy in a Western civilization. And because we are products of Western civilization, we tend to come to the study of history with certain biases or certain predispositions. One of those core dispositions or assumptions we make is that over time, Western civilization gradually evolved and evolved to become a more free and enfranchised society. And what I mean by that is that we evolved from the sort of society in which we put one person in power. And as the centuries passed, more and more people got little bits of that power. So I've tried to use my cute little animations here to show you I don't know, I think when we all imagine like the Middle Ages, we think of one lord or one king making the decisions. And then eventually, as he needs his knights, he needs to build support among the army, that power base expands out to the nobility. And then eventually, as we move through history, we get landowners. Those are my little arc icons of farmers, like holding produce. And then certainly when we get to the American colonies, we drop the requirement for land ownership, and it's just all men of a certain race. And then, of course, with the civil rights movement, uh, men of multiple races, or sorry, the civil rights movement, um, earlier Voting Rights Act. And then finally, at the peak of Western democracy, we have everybody over a certain threshold of age getting to vote. Of course, there are still some people disenfranchised. Uh, people, for example, who've committed a felony often lose the right to vote. But broadly speaking, we see this development of politics moving from very centralized to very dispersed, right? To power being in the hands of the many. And this is, we tend to think, as a good thing. It's for this reason that Americans and members of other Western European countries tend to look at less democratic places as more primitive. primitive. For example, Saudi Arabia just recently giving women the right to, um, to drive. We think, oh, wow, they're in the dark ages. Women are only now getting the right to drive. But that, again, kind of exposes our thinking uh, as Westerners of progress, right? That the government kind of slowly moves along until we reach a distribution point of power. In reality, though, the development of political systems across history is by no means linear. It goes up, it goes down, it changes. Uh, there are different value systems in different places. Even in the world as we live it right now, we have the US, which is not a direct democracy, but a representative democracy. We have some more progressive uh, Western institutions that are more built on uh, coalition building. And then we have uh, China, an autocratic power that has no um, goals or desires to really become a democracy in the way that the West would define, right? We're all living in the same century, but that doesn't mean that our political systems have all evolved to the same place. Um, we have kings and democracies in the exact same moment. So I think it's always important to keep in mind that when we approach history and the study of political systems, we're predisposed to see democracy as a good and natural product of evolution. But what I want to actually suggest today now as we turn from the modern uh, to the ancient, that what we see in Athens, I'm, and I'll pitch this to you a little bit later in the week, what we see in Athens is that Athenians, especially Athenian political leaders, gradually begin to wonder whether the old institutions that they had abandoned, 
might have helped them solve the problems created by democracy. So yes, it's certainly true that Athens became more democratic with the reforms of Solon, of Cleisthenes, of Pericles, right? All of these leaders gradually making Athens more and more inclusive, more and more democratic, Thrasybulus even wanting to include slaves. But in the exact same moment that this transformation is happening, there's plenty of leaders in Athens who think that we would be better off if we went to the older, less inclusive mechanism of ruling our city. And not today, but later in the week, I think probably next lecture, I'm going to tr encourage you to try to rethink the rise of the 30 tyrants and rethink the oligarchic coup of 411, not as evil takeovers by um, cruel oligarchs, but maybe a handful of Athenians desperately trying to reassert government the way it used to be, trying to define, make Athens great again in the way uh, that the early Athenians would have seen it. Okay, so now that we've laid out the context, the big ideas, the assumptions that we need to be aware of, we're going to start this lecture uh, now historically chronologically. I'm going to take you back to the earliest known political history of Athens when Athens was actually ruled by a king. I'm then going to show you archaic Athens and I'm going to teach you a little bit about this institution of the Areopagus, which up until now we haven't talked about at all. And then towards the end of my lecture, I'm going to try to explain or just put into your head how might some of the key events that we've studied in this class look different if the Areopagus had still been around and still been powerful. That's the hypothetical history aspect of today. All right, you think you've got that history, learn about the Areopagus, and then hypothetical history. Cool, let's dive in. All right, way back when. All right, by now you guys, I'm sure, remember a little bit about the mythological history that I taught you about how Athens got started. According to the mythology, we've now seen this myth more times than anyone probably wants to. According to the mythology, Hephaestus attempts to rape Athena and she wipes the seed, uh, the semen from her leg, which falls onto the ground that would become Athens. From that seed of Hephaestus springs this uh, strange hybrid creature, the snake man, King Erichthonius, which literally means sprung from the ground and he becomes the first mythological king of the Athenians. Where are we chronologically speaking? I mean, that's a nonsense question, right? This is mythology. But according to the Athenians' own chronological records, they would have probably put this foundation event somewhere between the year 2000 and like 1400 BCE. But again, it's like, I don't know, it's like trying to plot like a magic story in real geography. It's not possible. It's mythologically speaking. But what I think is significant about this myth, in addition to explaining why Athena is so prized among the Athenians, is that it shows you that from its very origins, Athens was not a democratic city. It was a monarchy, a very traditional monarchy. Now, after Erichthonius, who is not particularly well known unless you're a classic scholar like me, um, the most famous king of the Athenians, uh, for a reason I'll explain in a minute, is definitely the mythological figure Theseus. And even if you've never studied Greek history before, I'm pretty sure you've probably heard the name Theseus somewhere. He is the most famous king of Athens, but he becomes famous mostly for his great deeds. Although he was born into a royal family, uh, his father uh, is King Aegeus, from whom the Aegean Sea is named, uh, he was kind of abandoned as a baby and had to prove himself as royal blood. In order to prove himself, he had to do a bunch of labors, kill a bunch of monsters, kind of like the way Heracles did. As a teenager, Theseus was sent off to the island of Crete to battle the Minotaur. This is the myth that he's best known for. Um, the Minotaur lived in a kind of maze-like uh, compartment called the Labyrinth, and Theseus used the help of a young woman in Crete um, to, to take a string with him and walk through the maze. And then when he killed the Minotaur, he was able to use the string to find his way back. Right, so that's, that's where he really makes his reputation as the man who kills the monster. 
Um, on a side note, maybe a less famous myth, but I think, you know, I think to some degree we can be judged by our love lives. Theseus is also really famous for abandoning his girlfriend, Ariadne. Ariadne is a princess of Crete who helps Theseus against the Minotaur. And he kind of sort of maybe promises that he's going to marry her and take her back to Athens. But when they're like halfway back to Athens, they're sailing, they stop, they stop at an island and they all get off. But in the morning, he gets back on the boat and sails off before she's joined him. Now, Theseus will say, oops, I just guess I forgot my girlfriend. Other myths will claim that he intentionally abandoned her. But Theseus may be a really good hero, but not exactly a great boyfriend material. Anyway, um, fun stuff. <laughs> so Theseus is the hallmark best known king of Athenian monarchy, but politically speaking, he is considered important by the Athenians as a great unifier. You can see on this adorable little list um, from Wikipedia that Theseus is kind of in the middle of the kings of Athens. Right there's Erechtheus, Erechthonius, they, it's the same name really. Um, and then a couple generations down here we get Theseus. Um, but according to the historian Thucydides, played by Mary in our first section and Shreya in our second section, uh, Theseus is significant. I'm going to read from the passage from our reading last night. It was Theseus, a king of Athens in the period before the Trojan War, who unified Athens and Attica into one polis. This process was traditionally referred to as the soon oikismos, the living together. So even though Erechthonius is the first king of Athens, it's Theseus who takes both the city of Athens and the entire territory of Attica and unifies them under one rule. Now, we have to pause here and ask ourselves, how historical is this? Probably not at all. There is no historical evidence that someone named Theseus lived. Uh, we don't have a grave marker that says Theseus was here or anything. Uh, even the Athenians at the time of our game, some of them doubted the historicity of Theseus. But Theseus could be taken as a sort of hallmark figure, like many historical civilizations, as the one who unified or gave Athens its political identity. And I want to draw your attention to this little bubble here and note that if you're a fan of ancient history, you'll note that many cities and empires have a kind of origin king myth like this. For example, Rome had the twin brothers Romulus and Remus. Romulus, the surviving brother, becomes the king of Rome. That's why it's named Rome for his name. Romulus becomes Roma. The Persian Empire had Cyrus, right? Their foundational king. Um, although it actually appears Cyrus is pretty historical and not purely mythological. Sparta claimed to be the descendants of King Heracles, who should have been the ruler of the Peloponnese, but his descendants were driven out. So each of these city-states kind of attaches its political identity to a king figure, usually a king figure who's either anointed or descended from the gods. Uh, Romulus, the king of Rome, for example, is descended from uh, the, the uh, god of war, Ares. And Cyrus, you know, I don't know if I know enough about Persian history to know if he's considered to be descended from the gods. He's definitely anointed by the god Ahura Mazda. So there's always a connection between your foundational king and the divine. So does that answer your question about how historic is Theseus? I don't know, probably not. Anyway, we're going to roll with it. As we move from the mythological history of Athens's political system, however, where we can really begin to pin down true docu documented history for the political beginnings in Athens is closer to the year 800, right? The mythical history of Athens is like 1500 to 800. But around 800, we get to know a little bit more about how Athens really takes shape, politically speaking. And even here at its outset, one thing that's surprising is that Athens does not switch directly from monarchy to democracy. It has a long intermediate stage before Solon. And that intermediate stage has everything to do with this council called the Council of the Areopagus. Now, let me back up for just a second 
and explain that clearly somewhere along the way, Athens went from being a king city-state to a council city-state. How does that happen? We have no idea. But if we could take Rome for an example, um, what we see in, in Rome as a counterpart is that Rome also begins as a city-state with a king, but gradually the kings become, according to the mythology, worse and worse. And they also produce more and more family members who begin to fight and rival amongst themselves. And as they do so, those families become part of a unit of like the ruling families of Rome, which will eventually become the Roman Senate. Uh, the first Roman Senate was made up of the hundred leading families of the Romans. And so even though we don't have an equivalent story about how the Athenians came up with an Areopagus, my best guess is it's something like that, right? Athens first had kings, but they had to rely on lords and other uh, sort of local noble families. The families produced more children, they got bigger and bigger. And so eventually the power of the king is dramatically weakened and is replaced or supplanted by a power of the unified leading families instead. And that's where you get an Areopagus. A little bit about the Areopagus itself. What is it named for? What does it actually do? Well, Areopagus is named uh, more for a place than for a person. The word pagos in Greek means a hill or an outcropping. And Ares um, is, of course, the name for a very specific hill in Athens. The Areopagus is the hill of Ares. And it was the place where this council of elder statesmen was said to meet. It was their location, right? It would have been a high enough hill that everyone in Athens would have known exactly where it was and could have gathered there. Unlike the Roman Senate, we don't have very clear numbers from early on about how many people actually served in the Areopagus. But if we take the logistics of how the Areopagus was chosen, we can get some kind of approximation. The only people who were allowed to be in the Areopagus were people who had already served in some sort of major government position. In early, early Athens, about 800 BC, that was probably somewhere between three and nine people per year. So you had to be essentially like a White House level official. After you retired from that government job, you were then given an invitation to join the Areopagus. And if we sort of expand that out, right, like say we have nine people a year multiplied by 20 years, you're going to get somewhere between 100 and 300 people. So a pretty small number, right? We're talking like the number of the American Senate, a small group of people, all of whom would have known each other, all of whom would have married into each other's families, a very tight unit of the leading noblemen of Athens. And of course, we're talking men. There are no women allowed into the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus had a couple of key functions. Its most important one was, of course, ruling Athens, making political decisions for Athens. But the Areopagus was also responsible for choosing the lead government officials per year. And after the monarchy, what we know about the Athenian government system is that you have this Areopagus council and you also have a couple of uh, government officials called archons. I'm going to read this passage in a minute, but I want to remind you in our game sessions, the archons were pretty watered down political officials. There were two of them in my first class session uh, and there was only one in my smaller second class session. And do you remember what the Archons did in our game? The Archons were the ones that you went to when you had some sort of trial legal charge to bring against somebody else. That's because by the time of our game, the Archon political officials' powers had been greatly diminished. But in early, early Athens, again, think like 800, 700 BCE, Archons had an immense amount of power and they were chosen by the Areopagus. Okay, let's read this passage from our reading. In the early days after the removal of the monarchy, there were apparently three archons. The Basileus Archon, the King Archon, in charge of religious and state rituals. The Polymarchus, the Polymarchon, the War Archon, who is in charge of war. And then one simple Archon. I think of this as like 
Archon Light or Archon Basic, uh, who had general administrative duties and was probably a slightly later invention than the two. So what you can see is that Athens is creating a wartime branch, an executive branch, and an administrative branch within these Archon positions. And then later we see the six more Archons were added called the Thesmothetai, the lawgivers, who were in some way in charge of the state's laws, although to be frank, we just don't have that much information about them. It seems that it from an early stage, eventually, Archon served for 10 years, as we see in that passage. But as time went on and the more and more family members grew, these families wanted more opportunities to each have a bite at these political positions, so they were reduced to one-year terms. Kind of like in our game, the leader of the Delian League has to be reelected every year, and most government officials can only serve for one-year terms, right? By creating a one-year term, you allow more people to have a chance to serve in that position, and each elite family wanted their sons, their brothers, their fathers to have a bite at that apple. Now, now that we've kind of laid out what early Athens looked like, it has a governing council, and it's selecting the political leaders who will then themselves join the Areopagus Council. I want to now spell out some of the dangers and some of the benefits, right? Kind of a pros and cons list. If we were to go back to the time of the Areopagus, what might be some of the sacrifices we'd make and what might some of the benefits we'd get be? All right, uh, the first downside of an Areopagus, I have a feeling is exactly what you might guess. When you have a small governing council of somewhere between 100 to 300 people, you get exactly what it looks like, a circular oligarchic grip on power. And every time the oligarch spoke up, or certainly the Socratic spoke up in our game sessions, usually our class erupted in some sort of protest like, oh, the, the oligarchs are just trying to grab more power. Oh, the Socratics just want to become philosopher kings. And in a sense, they have a good point, right? There's almost something incestuous about the same families in Athens again and again being a part of the governing council and then getting to pick their political officials who will then themselves become a part of the governing council, right? You see what I mean? It's just like the cycle of power repeating itself. And I'm going to spare you all my Bernie Sanders impression, which I know is terrible, but nonetheless, it's the same thing he's complaining about, right? When we have people in power making the laws, that just further keeps them in power and so on and so forth. In fact, if you want to compare this a little bit to modern American society, one thing that always strikes me, for example, is just how many of our presidents come from the exact same universities, right? 26% of our presidents come from an Ivy League school, right? Harvard being the top, then Yale, then the U.S. Military Academy, Princeton, Stanford has one. I don't know how many College of William and Mary have. But there's this almost sort of incestuous feeling about it, right? Even Obama came from the Harvard Law School after going to... Um, uh, what was it, Occidental, or was it somewhere else, uh, for beginning of his undergraduate career. And, and so you get the sense that there's a few educational institutions who have a real grip on power. Now, of course, I think you're going to see that change over time, but it doesn't surprise me anymore to hear that a U.S. senator went to Princeton or that um, you know, Pete Buttigieg went to Harvard. It's, it's the same institutions coming up again and again and again. And the ones who didn't go to college, I can almost certainly assure you where it says the red bar, none of them have undergraduate school, came from early in American history. We would never imagine electing a president who had zero college experience. Well, never say never. I never would have thought we'd elect someone who had their own reality television show. So who knows, right? Maybe, maybe next election cycle. And with the, San oh, let me go back. I went too quick. Um, you know, indeed what Bernie Sanders complains about is that what we're seeing over time is that the growing top 10% are, are uh, gaining more and more wealth in our capitalist society, whereas the bottom 50% have a tiny percentage of, of American wealth. And of course, people who are very wealthy, like the Bill Gates and the Jeff Bezos, all they have to do is pick up the phone to call up a state senator or the president and 
uh, can enact or support legislation that they think is beneficial to them. I'm not trying to heap any blame on uh, Bill Gates, who is actually a pretty remarkable philanthropist in the modern age. But you know what I'm saying, right? That people with money can buy power, which just perpetuates power and so on and so forth. The gap grows. So problem number one with a small governing council like the Areopagus that gets to pick its own members, rinse and repeat the same people, the same powers. Problem number two, which you may have experienced if you were ever on a group project with somebody, the more and more you contain power within the same hands of the same types of people, the less opportunity you have for an influx of new ideas and perspectives. The Areopagus, as far as we could tell, often agreed on political decisions because, of course, they had very similar profiles. The early Areopagus was almost exclusively wealthy, land-owning, old Athenian families. And even though they certainly scrapped between themselves for power, they tended to see things the same way, right? Laws that benefited landowners, trade policies that benefited landowners, uh, work conditions that benefited landowners, uh, imports, export markets that benefited landowners. And so maybe without their even realizing it, they created a society that was so skewed towards um, the interests of rich landowning farmers and gradually disenfranchised everybody else, right? That's why Solon had to come in and solve the starvation problem and the economic disparity problem. Um, not because I think that the early members of the Areopagus were evil or bad political decision makers, but just because whenever you have the same group of people making the same decision over and over again, um, that you end up with a tilted system. You can even think about that here in your own college major, right? One of the reasons why the history department doesn't hire all Civil War specialists is because we don't want a department that overly tilts towards one branch or one type of history. It's the same in the, say, psychology department between quantitative and qualitative psychology or in the business and marketing, right? They, that you want a, a variety of people from different perspectives so that you have a good diversity of ideas. The last um, uh, downfall or con of a governing council made up of the same elite families is maybe one that you didn't necessarily uh, suspect, which is that the only thing super predictable about oligarchies contained in family tribes is that you're going to get cons uh, persistent infighting among members. You see this in the tiers of the Russian oligarchs. Uh, you see this among Chinese plutocrats. Right, whenever you have a small group of people who have a lot of power distributed amongst themselves, they all just want more power. So I've kind of imagined in this slide my uh, key oligarch standing on the pilaster saying, it's my turn, it's my turn to speak, right? And any of you who are fans of the, the movie Kill Bill, boy, it's been a while, I've forgotten the names of all the characters. There's this great scene where the uh, Chinese, or, or sorry, no, Japanese mafia is meeting and all the mafia bosses are arguing about who gets uh, what slice of the pie. And, and there's a great head rolling. Go watch Kill Bill. I'm sure you all have a lot of time on your hands right now. Anyway, let's rein that analogy back in. I don't have to go to Kill Bill because we already know that in at early Athens itself, there was a pretty deadly example of this sort of oligarchic infighting. In the year 632, the fighting between the families actually got really deadly, surrounded by this one figure from the Areopagus named Chilon, or Cylon, if you pr prefer to pronounce it with a C. Chilon was a member of an aristocratic Athenian family. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. And what gave him even bigger aspirations for power is the fact that he was married to a princess from the neighboring city of Megara. Now, unlike Athens, Megara at the time did not have a governing council. It had a pure tyrant, right? Someone who had seized power illegally. And because Chilon married into the family of a tyrant, he began, we think, to get ambitions about being a tyrant for himself. In our reading last night, Thorley actually mentions the example of Chilon in 632 BC. And he explains that a man called Chilon, a member of one of the aristocratic families, 
with the help of his father-in-law and friends within Athens, tried to make himself a tyrant. Kind of like Pisistratus, right? The guy who rode in on the horses. The difference is that, um, remember with that really tall Athena, fake Athena woman. The difference is that Pisistratus was a member of the poorer classes, kind of like a Robin Hood figure, whereas Chilon was a member of an elite family who wanted to get power over all the other elite families. Now, according to what we know mostly from the historian Herodotus, um, they managed to seize the Acropolis, but that was as far as they got. Nobody else supported the attempted coup, and Chilon and his men were kind of trapped on the Acropolis. Chilon himself apparently escaped, but his supporters surrendered. And his supporters managed to were willing to surrender because they were promised sanctuary, right? That they would not be harmed if they peacefully surrendered. But the other Athenian elite families, the aristocrats, turned their back on these supporters. And according to the reading, they were all massacred on the instructions of the archons, or specifically from one archon named Megacles, a member of the Alcmaeonid family. Remember, the Alcmaeonid family is the very old family line that Pericles came from. So this example is a classic case study of the constant infighting of the elite families and each of them trying to get one up on another. And funny enough, though, just within a couple generations of, um, of uh, Chilon and Megacles, the Archons, uh, massacring his supporters, we see that the tables completely turn. Forgive my Office reference. I'm kind of wa binge watching The Office lately because it makes me feel better about life. Uh, oh, how the turn tables turn, right? <laughs> I'm going to read the passage here. About 30 years later, there was an interesting sequel. By this time, Chilon's family seems to have gained much more influence, and they accused the Alcmaeonids of, of sacrilege for having massacred all those supporters who claimed sanctuary during the coup. The whole family of the Alcmaeonids was thrown out of Athens, and the bones of their ancestors were dug up and thrown out of the country. So here we see that, kind of like the movie The Godfather, right, each family is vying for power against the other. And in one generation, one family might be up, but in the next generation, it's the other family that goes up. And these families never forgive grudges, they never forget, they're always waiting for a moment to pounce, right? Okay, so to recap, the three main um, cons of uh, a council like the Areopagus is one, that secular, incestuous, self-selecting power, two, a lack of new ideas and new perspectives, and three, the potential for mafia or mob boss-like family infighting. That's the dark side of a governing council. But for the rest of the week, I'm going to try to show you some examples of the upside of a governing council, especially in contrast to democracy. For the remainder of today's lecture, I think I've probably got about 10 more minutes, um, I want to introduce you briefly to just three potential upsides on how maybe Athens might have been different if they had adopted these instead of sticking so heavily with a direct democracy. Example number one, or pro number one, when you have a small governing council, it allows you to really check and select for leadership qualities. You don't get random people in office and you don't just get populists in office, you get people who've been sort of pre-selected for their qualities. Number two, speed and efficiency of decision-making. It is way easier to get 100 like-minded people to agree on something than 20,000 direct democracy people all yelling at each other. And three, maybe there is something to be said for expertise and experience in deliberations. Remember, the Areopagus was made up of people, only people, who had had an archon government position before. That meant that everybody who was in the Areopagus had already had experience making big political decisions. And there's something to be said for that kind of expertise. So play with me just a little bit while I take you down some hypothetical history roads with each of these possibilities. And I'd like to start with number one, um, selecting for leadership abilities. Time again in the first half of our class, we have seen that very often Athens picks political leaders 
or gravitates to them, not necessarily because they make the smartest decisions, but because they're really charismatic. So let me ask you, how might our history of our class had gone differently if Athens had had an Areopagus to select leaders and not just the voting of the people? Would it have been possible for someone like Pericles to oust Cimon, to malign him for the slave revolt of the Spartans and the fact that Cimon's help was rejected? Would the Areopagus have maybe whiffed out just how dangerous a person someone like Alcibiades was? The Athenian people loved Alcibiades. He was handsome. He was fun-loving. He loved a party. He was a really good public speaker. And so when, as a young, um, you know, late 20-year-old, he uh, gave a big speech about the Sicilian expedition and said, yes, let's go. This is our moment for glory. The people of Athens totally went there with him. But if we had had an Areopagus in place, a council of elders who had uh, already served in government positions, they might have taken a second look at someone like Alcibiades and said, you know, he's got a lot of charisma, but I'm not sure he has the substance, right? They might have kind of put a check on someone like him who led Athens in the very dangerous uh, route of going to Sicily and losing a dreadful, dreadful war because of his inexperience. What might history look like, uh, how might Athenian history have looked differently if um, Athens had had a government body better equipped to make fast decisions? In the third week of our class, we played out the starvation lottery scenario, right? When Sparta was sitting right outside our city walls. And one of the reasons that things went so badly for Athens, many of you wrote your second research assignment on this, it went badly because the Athenians uh, dallied away a lot of their time uh, just kind of huddling down, hunkering down, assuming things would get better, fighting about whether to surrender or not. If we had had an Areopagus in place, if our class had just decided to pick three people and said, all right, you make the decision, I have a feeling the Areopagus would have been able to make that call much faster. Eventually, we did get there, right? Eventually, Athens did select a council of elites. They appointed Theramenes to be their head negotiator. But an Areopagus could have snapped their fingers and launched that months before people starved. The last uh, potential pro here, what does it mean to have government officials who have real experience deliberating over things and not making decisions based on a pure mob mentality? I have a feeling, for example, that if the Areopagus had gotten to try the case of the generals of Argonusae, they might not have voted to execute all 10 of them, right? They might have let cooler minds prevail. Or even the trial of Socrates, right? Remember, the trial of Socrates, which we just learned about last week, was largely decided by people who didn't have any experience studying Socrates. They didn't know much philosophy. They had seen Aristophanes play the clouds and thought that Socrates was some weirdo in a basket talking about Zeus all the time. But if we'd had a trial under the Areopagus, we would have gotten a much more educated jury body. People who, even if they didn't like Socrates, could appreciate that the sort of high-level philosophical thinking he was doing might have been radical, but wasn't worth the death sentence. I don't know, this is hypothetical history, right? Like we can't know what they would have decided, but I do suspect that it wouldn't have been as driven by popular opinion. And of course the amnesty of Athens, I really don't know how the Areopagus would have gone, right? Might they have uh, decided to stick with an amnesty that forgiveness and cool headed thinking was in fact better for Athens? Or might they have decided to make an example of their own elites kind of the way the Archon Megacles um, from the Alcmanid clan did with Chilon the Tyrant, right? We might have seen a few more of the 30 or the supporters of the 3,000 punished for treating Athens so badly. So in the counterweight to our three cons, we have three pros, efficient decision-making, checking, putting a check on populist leaders, and having more wisdom in decision-making than a mob mentality. Unfortunately, or fortunately for the Athenians, they decided not to go the route of the Areopagus. And in fact, if we look at the evolution of Athens's political history, 
we see that in many ways, at least in two key moments, they made drastic cuts to the power of the Areopagus. And this is the last section of my lecture I want to close on. I want to teach you a little bit about how it is that the Areopagus went from being this super powerful institution in the 800s to 700s and then gradually lost its power to the hands of direct democracy. The first step towards that downfall had to do with our familiar political reformer Solon. Think back to Solon. Remember, Solon was that early archaic leader, uh, the one who was asked to solve the problem of debt slavery, of starvation, of the landowners, rich landowners having too much power and everyone else essentially being a sharecropper. One of Solon's most important reforms was to try to shake up the power of the Areopagus. And the key decision he made was that the Areopagus should not get to pick Archons anymore. I imagine him kind of saying to the Areopagus, look, we've got to break up your power. We're going to take the power to pick Archons out of the hands of all these elite families. No more favoritism. I'm not just going to let you pick your own sons or your own brothers or your own fathers to be Archon this year. You're actually going to have to let other voices be heard. And if you can open up the Archonship, of course, that also allows for new membership in the Areopagus, right? So you change one and you have a reformed Areopagus as well. According to our reading, uh, Solon kept the nine law Archons, but election to the Archonship was now open from anyone in the highest wealth class. And although noble families were undoubtedly still in the highest wealth class, this also allowed for people of new money, or potentially even people who had moved to Athens just a generation before. So as this archonship position becomes an elected office made up of the wealthy, yes, but not just a few elite families, now the Areopagus is gradually getting an influx of new members and new representation, right? And they don't have that complete grip, that incestuous grip on who gets to be an archon in the future years. Solon also makes an important decision that he is going to take away some uh, of the Areopagus's legal powers, but as a trade-off, he still lets them essentially have full say over VIP cases. What about the Council of the Areopagus? Certainly its power was reduced, um, but its status in, as an august body of, el body of elder statesmen may have been enhanced. It retained power to try cases of homicide, and Solon also gave the Areopagus the formal task of supervising the laws and the constitution, right? So Solon gives them power that's kind of similar to what we see in Sparta with the Gerousia, right? The Areopagus has the right to kind of veto any institution or ideas that it sees, <clears throat> pardon me, as being unconstitutional. Now, I want to close up here, again, pardon me, <clears throat> a bit of a frog in my throat. There we go. By emphasizing that Solon wasn't the only one to make drastic changes. In the 460s, Pericles and his colleague Ephialtes also launched an attack on the Areopagus. And he utterly cut the legs out from the Areopagus by essentially leaving them only one main power left, and that was to rule on murder cases. Now, that still means that the expertise and the elder statesman role of the Areopagus is important because if you have a big VIP murder case like an O.J. Simpson trial, you want that decision of life or death to be made by people who have a lot of experience in government. But all of the other role of the Areopagus to pick archons or to have constitutional authority was taken from them. And in so doing, Pericles manages to assert the role of the people over the Areopagus. Why should the will of the people be hampered by the whims of a few old men? Let the Areopagus rule on murder cases and nothing more. As we proceed through the rest of this week, therefore, we're going to be continuing to return to the 30 tyrants and the oligarchic coup of 411 and ask ourselves, is it possible that many of the problems that Athens faced in the fifth century, you guys have been telling me over and over again, Athens is its own worst enemy. 
Would Athens have been better off if they stuck to a government system more like what Sparta had, which kept a governing council of elders in place? And to tie this into an issue we're facing right at this very moment, I can't help but wonder as we, um, as I listen to news coverage of the coronavirus, about this trend that's emerging in news reporting about the difference in the way autocratic regimes are handling coronavirus versus democratic regimes, right, or democratic governments. Uh, and Politico, just published today, was a piece on democracy on trial as coronavirus spreads. Democratic governments are all about individualism, right? They're all about letting people make their own decisions and distributing power in the hands of governors, mayors, state legislatures. But is that actually serving us well as we face down a global pandemic? And in contrast, many people are wondering about what is the relationship between coronavirus and autocracy? Is China uh, and other auto growing autocratic countries like Hungary or Russia, are they going to use coronavirus as an opportunity to seize even more power? Or maybe is there something to be said for a strongman leader having the right to just snap his fingers and say, the whole country is on lockdown right now, we're going to enforce military order, we're going to build hospitals without having to go through a Congress or a Senate or anything like that. So I certainly don't have the answers, but this question of the pros and cons of keeping power in the hands of a few versus distributing it to the many is at the forefront of my mind. All right, stay happy, stay healthy, guys, and I'll see you on Wednesday.